So I read it and I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm not sure where those thoughts land. I have a lot of mixed feelings, good feelings, bad feelings, grossed out feelings, annoyed feelings, really angry feelings. <laughs> So I figured the best way to kind of process those feelings would be to talk about it on a YouTube video, as one does. This has zero structure, it is completely spoiler filled, so if you've not read it and you don't want to be spoiled, don't watch this video. However, if you have read it and you have thoughts and you'd like to share and talk with me, I'm just gonna go. So you could join in, comment down below as you know, we go. And we're, we're just going to talk about the thing that is it. First of all, did this book need to be 1200 pages? I really truly don't feel like it did. I think that there was way too much detail put in that was actually necessary for the story and for the theming. The themes could have been gotten across in a 500 page book. It did not need 1200 pages. And I kind of feel like it makes me annoyed because I'm like, Stephen King, bro, bro man, Stephen King, bro man, you did not need 1200 pages to write this, which makes me think that you were trying to write a big epic grand horror story that could be read throughout the years. And it, it has been, but is it as good as it could have been? Did it need 1200 pages? The biggest reason I have for questioning, th questioning this is that I feel like a lot of our time is spent with the children on an individual level, all six, seven of them, even as they're adults, we spend individual time with all of them. We get to see them each interact with it the first time. We get to each see them interact with it the second time when they go back into Dairy when they're adults. And we get to see them each interact with it with like a partner or two at the beginning when they're still trying to figure things out. Like how Richie and Bill go to Ebol Street to find Eddie's leper. So we have three distinct interactions almost on a completely individual level with it. And it's supposed to be to kind of parse out the characters' fears and their interactions and the way they view it. But do we need three? I don't think so. I don't think we needed three of each individual. Maybe one of each. It could have been spread out. I know there's a lot of plot implications about how it interacts with the children as far as like their destiny goes. But again, a little excessive, unnecessary, and each scene with it of each individual children was like two or three chapters. Just felt completely unnecessary to me and like he just likes the sound of his own voice or the sound of his own keyboard as he's typing. The reason why I'm confused is because I feel this way but then on the other hand I know that I know these characters so well because I got all of these individual interactions. I know Richie, Eddie, Bill, Beverly, Stan, Mike, Ben, I got them all. And if you've watched any of my like reviews or wrap ups, I don't remember character names ever. I'm like our main protagonist, the guy and then the girl. But I have all six and seven of those kids names because I know them so well because I spent chapters upon chapters with them individually parsing out who they are as people. So I'm annoyed because I don't think it was necessary for the story, but I'm not too annoyed because I know I know them so well now. I don't know how to feel. Next, let's talk about the thing that I know how I feel about, okay? The hypersexualization of an 11 year old girl. This is the tea, okay? It's the grossest thing I've ever read in my life. We do not need to hear a description of how an 11 year old's panties are sticking out from underneath her shorts and sexualize it. I understand the commentary he's trying to make on turning from a kid into a teen slash adult. If they were 13, I would totally have gotten it but she's 11. I have a nine year old niece, okay? I can't imagine her being two years older from now and someone looking at her that way. And if someone was looking at her that way, even if it was someone her age, I would be skeeved out. Like no question about it whatsoever. Beyond this, I think it just speaks to Stephen King's creepiness as a sexist, because if you've read any of his writing, you know that he writes women in a completely sexist way. I don't know the exact term for it, but he sexualizes them so much. They're not real to him. They're, he tries to act like he thinks they're real. He tries to give them real character depth, like Beverly. He tried to give her real fears, but all of her fears were sexual, and she was 11. And I know there's commentary there on, like, innocence and what that really looks like in America, but she was 11. And then as an adult, that was all, that was all she thought about. That was all her fears were. Back to what I was saying. There was one specific scene where all of the kids are walking in a line in the forest, single file. He goes down the list and says, who is who, who is where? I don't know what their order was, but he's like, boy, 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 just their names. We get to Beverly in the middle and he has to talk about the way her white tank top was Cover, hugging her back and the way her jeans was hugging the curve of her butt and her budding breasts underneath her shirt. I'm like, God, she is the laughing. That is completely unacceptable. And just, ah, it made me so angry. 
And that's just one example. It happened multiple, multiple times where the, all the guys are together and there's no comment on what any of them are wearing except maybe the fact that Ben is wearing a sweatshirt, but that makes sense. But all of them are thinking about what Beverly is wearing and how she's wearing it. And I'm a chick. I'm a girl. So I don't really know if that's what guys are like when they're a teenager. So I asked my husband, not even a teenager, a preteen. Anyways, I asked my husband, I said, when you were 11, were you thinking this way about girls already? And he said, no. So I can understand if like Richie was thinking that way about Beverly because he seems to have the most understanding of sex as an 11 year old and he seems to have the most, he makes the dirty jokes more often, but for all six of them to be thinking about Beverly that way was completely unnecessary, not realistic, and I just speaks more to the hypersexualization of an 11 year old. I don't understand why King felt the need to do this. I haven't even talked about the scene in the sewers and all I'm going to say about the scene in the sewers is that... I have read his explanation, Stephen King's explanation for why he did this. I have read the criticism for it, and I can understand both sides. However, if this was actually Stephen King's motivation was to provide some sort of way out and the bridge between adulthood and whatever, call them back to themselves after their traumatic experience, whatever, there was not enough setup for that. The fact that you had to tell us that years later, after you wrote the book, and after everyone called you out on your bullshit, means that you didn't actually think that way because you didn't put it in the book. You have 1,200 pages where you put so much in the book, but you didn't put in enough logical reasoning for why all the, for why that scene had to happen. It was completely unnecessary, completely unjustified, and I don't care what anyone says. All right, let's move on from that topic. It's not redeemable in any way, and it makes me never want to pick up a Stephen King book again because that was unnecessary. And you have will have people reading this book feeling justified for sexualizing 11-year-olds when Stephen King did it. And I understand it's twisted in this book and it's supposed to be a little bit twisted, but also it's normalized. It is freaking normalized and that is not okay. Next, let's talk about it itself. Now, I wasn't ever that freaked out by it. I personally am someone that, like I said in my wrap up the other day, I don't watch horror. I don't read a lot of horror. And I think the only reason I got through it was because it was an audiobook. So I don't know how I would have felt if I was reading the book and I was immersed in it with my eyes and not working and typing at the same time that I'm listening. But I wasn't ever scared. There were a couple of scenes that got stuck in my head and said later that night when I went to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night that I thought about it, but not in the way that I felt like it should have if this was the greatest horror book ever written, one of the greatest ever written. So there's that part where I just don't think it was that scary. And I should have said this at the beginning of the video, but I really struggled with the first section, the first big chunk of the book. I couldn't get past um, how... King was introducing us to all of our characters through the perspective of a side character. I found that really annoying. <laughs> Honestly, I just wanted to get to know the characters already. I get what he was going for, but it really made immersion early on difficult and I had problems investing in the story. I tweeted about it. I said, is it worth it if I keep going? 99% of the people said no. I had one person who I trust his judgment on stories say that the last third of the book was way better than the two thirds. So if you could push through, the last third might make it worth it, but he wasn't sure. So what I did was I scrolled to 75% of the audiobook and I started the audiobook at 75%. I did feel like I was missing some context, but not a lot because I'd seen the movies and so I was able to enjoy the last third of the book. After I did that, I realized that I was curious what the rest of the book was like. So I went back to where I stopped originally and kept going. And I think if I had pushed past just a little bit more, I might have been able to keep going in the first place. But maybe not because that first part of the book is difficult. Part of that is because King, the way he writes, everyone in his world is depraved. Everyone is sick and twisted. And everyone has like really dark issues. And so if you're not used to reading that kind of stuff and you have to put your mind in that situation, it can be difficult. I think I definitely struggled with that. I, I just don't know. I don't know what it was specifically about the reading experience at the beginning. I do know that the narrator was really annoying. I think he probably did a good job, but at the beginning, I couldn't get past his voice and the way he did his voices. Let's talk about that for a minute because the way that the narrator did his voices reminded me a lot of the way, and it affected the way I read the way that King writes women. So not just Beverly here. I'm talking Eddie's mom. I'm talking Eddie's wife. I'm talking... Bill's wife, I'm talking, what are the other women in this book? Beverly's mom, Bill's mom, Richie's mom. I feel like King has a very low view of women. And I know this book was written in the 80s. And so these views of women are actually kind of pretty common based off of what I've seen from other 80s produced material and media. 
But that still doesn't excuse it. I get annoyed when people say things like, oh, well, they're a product of their time. There were people that were also writing books and media at this time that did not have this problematic view of women. And it's just, just in simple terms, it's they're either annoying, flighty, super sexy, or like demure and like not really important and kind of keeps to himself and is, and is really quiet. There wasn't an example of an actual strong woman in this book. I also just, I mean, like, why do you have six boys and one girl in a group? Eh, I kind, I kind of get what he's saying with it, but also I just, eh, it wasn't, it's just gross. It's not necessary and it's just a little gross to me. One thing that I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed and I wasn't expecting, even though I know King's reputation, but the greater magic involved in the character and the monster itself and the fact that it wasn't just like some demon thing, that's kind of what I'd always been told, but the fact that it was like some kind of extra dimensional space probe guy guy that came from space and the way it affected the whole town and the just the greater magic and lore of the story i was not prepared for and i really enjoyed it the turtle and the ritual of chud even though i'm not fully i don't fully understand what i'm talking what's happening with all that i think it's cool does that count <laughs> in general though the themes of like childhood magic and um, imagination versus adulthood cynicism and the way that affects what we view and the way that affects what level of depravity we're comfortable with I thought was really interesting as well as themes of corruption and like the root of the evil at the heart of everything and if you root out and dig up that evil seed that the rest of the town will go back to normal or people will move away and they'll change and they'll become different and they'll become better so I really appreciated and enjoyed where that went the last thing I want to talk about is just King's obsession with sex in general and I feel like he connects sex and fear very tightly because like I've said I've read others of King's books and they're always interwoven a lot and I think there's some validity to that we don't have to get into all of that but I do have a problem with just how aggressive it was and it happened a lot where a innocuous situation nothing sexual about it whatsoever and he has to bring in sex and I just don't understand it it's not something that I personally get apparently it's something that a lot of people get though a lot of people like it and enjoy it because he's really popular and famous. Those types of things just make me not want to read his stuff though because it's it's annoying to me and it's too over the top and in your face. But I, I could be alone. This could just be me. <laughs> so like I said, I have a lot of conflicted feelings with this story. This may have been just completely, completely, I may not even be able to edit this and post it. But I wanted to kind of talk through and get some of my thoughts out because I've been carrying them around for a bit and I, that's the way you know it's a good story. So I, I think it was a good story but I have a lot of issues with a lot of the ways that King chose to address certain topics and the way that he chose to go about it and I may be projecting a bit of my understanding of his character as an author onto other things that I've heard about him and that's not necessarily fair. I should take the writing for the writing but also if this is what you're giving me I'm going to accept it for what you're giving me. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm reading too far into these things. It's there on the page. I'm just picking it up. Thank you guys for listening to me ramble. I hope this was slightly coherent. I'm not sure. If you have read it and you think any of the same things as me, please comment down below. I would like to start this discussion because, I don't know, I'm tired of books just being accepted as fantastic when they're not when they have good and bad. And I want to talk about the bad more often than the good because the good it's easy to just kind of accept that the good is there, but the bad actually I feel like deserves a little bit more conversation of why is it there? Is it beneficial in any way? I think it, I think it bodes more conversation. The bad does than the good. That may just be me. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this video. As incoherent as it may be, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Leave a comment down below if you have anything to add to this discussion. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.